I can describe today's video in two words. Pirates. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Reach. This is Weaver Leather Supply. You might know me from my YouTube channel, The Leatherverse. Today we're gonna to take on a project that at first glance might seem a little bit too complicated if you're new, maybe a intermediate level, but I promise you, if you know how to work a swivel knife and a bevel, you can do this. I'm gonna walk you through it step by step. So let's go ahead and jump in. So let's take a look at the tools that you're gonna need for this project. An edge bevel swivel knife, a border tool, a medium-sized bevel, a matting tool, a maul, and some tape, and of course some leather. Now it's time for prepping the project. We're gonna start by taping the back of the leather. This is gonna prevent the leather from stretching out of shape while we're tooling it. Let's go ahead and case the leather next. We wanna put just enough moisture on there so it takes about one to two seconds for the moisture to soak in. Now I'm not gonna go over how to trace the pattern onto the tracing paper, then move it over to the leather. You know how to do that. What I am gonna tell you is that if you'll take painter's tape or masking tape and roll it so the sticky sides out, you can put that on the back of your leather and then stick it to your work surface. That's gonna make sure it doesn't move. Then we can take the tracing paper that's already got our pattern on it, lay it over the top of the leather and then tape that to our work surface as well, not to the leather. That way we know we're locking the tracing paper and the leather in relation to each other and they're not really gonna shift around or move. It'll just make it easier for you. Step two, cutting in the project. So this is one of my favorite parts of any project and that's cutting the design into the leather. And as we do it, we're gonna start on the outside and we're gonna work our way all the way around the outer border and we're just gonna come, we're gonna work our way inward. So you should start one, two, three, four and do the same all the way around. We're just working straight lines for right now. But I know for a lot of you, the swivel knife can be very frustrating. This particular project has a lot of straight lines in it and they're longer straight lines. So I'm gonna give you a tip on how to make sure they're as straight as possible. When you go to cut it in, you want all the movement to come from your shoulder and your elbow. What you don't wanna do is this. We're not rocking our way down through there. That's gonna end up with a lot of choppy lines. So what we wanna do is we wanna pull it backward. You can see it's coming from my shoulder and as it comes back, my elbow starts to bend. And if you do that, it's gonna give you a lot better chance of having a perfectly straight line than if we're, we're chopping our way down through there. Next step, beveling. Now this is the one that you really have to be patient with because it's gonna take some time. It's the biggest chunk of this project. So as we go through it, you're gonna hear me talk about beveling inward and beveling outward. So if I say beveling inward, I mean we're beveling towards the center design. If I say we're beveling outward, we're beveling towards the outer border. And the first step is we're gonna bevel this center panel. And what we're gonna do is the shading should come towards the middle. So as I said, we're beveling towards the center. We're gonna do that on both sides. At this point in the project, I really was starting to get excited about it because you can see the shading and the depth starting to develop. The next step is to do it all the way around the outside. We're not gonna do any of the lines on the inside. Go all the way around the outside. We're beveling to the edge of the leather. So we're gonna do it all the way around and then come back. So let's start that. All right, so at this point, you should have the center panel beveled to the inside you should have the outer border beveled to the outside. The next step is we're gonna bevel the center line on each side of the design. So it would be this one and this one. So if you haven't got it already, let's get this line down through here. This is gonna be the edge of the spine. I haven't gotten mine yet, so let's go ahead and bevel that. It's gonna be beveled the same direction as the line that we just beveled here. So the center line is beveled away from the image. The spine line is beveled away from the image. All right, we're getting close to being done with the beveling on the border, so don't give up yet. Next thing we're gonna be doing is beveling the bars that we have here on the top and the bottom. And this is really easy. If it's on the outside, we're gonna bevel to the outside. If it's the line on the inside, we're gonna bevel to the inside. We're gonna do that front and back. 
If you need any help with your beveling, we put out a video and it shows all the different factors that affect your beveling. Go back and catch that video. We'll put a link in the description. That way you can make sure that your beveling is on point before you tackle this project. Okay, next is the spine. And what we're gonna do here is the bottom of all of the lines are gonna be beveled to the bottom and the top of the lines are all gonna be beveled to the top. So while you're working on the beveling, you might ask yourself, this is kind of a convoluted way of going about beveling these. Well, the reason I'm having you do it this way is so that you can be very clear on what direction everything should be beveled. All right, so real quick, let's recap where we're at. What should you have done to this point? You should have tooled all the way around the inside panel, front and back, and that should be beveled towards the center. You should have beveled all the way around the entire project. That should be beveled to the outside. You should have beveled the top and bottom bands, front and back. Those should be beveled to the top or bottom, depending on which side you're working on. And then we would have beveled the center lines away from the design. And then the spine, we would have beveled the top, I guess the top's on top. We would bevel the top line to the top and the bottom line to the bottom. And we made sure that we didn't miss this line right through here. So now it's time for step number, I've lost track, border stamps. So for this step, what we're going to do is we're going to create this rope border that goes all the way around the designs on the front and back. Now I have a link for this, but this is a really cool braided stamp that you can get from Weaver. Like I said, there's a link in the description for it. And what we're going to do with it is we're going to use this to go all the way around the border. The key here is to make sure that as you go around, the rope flows all the same direction. You don't want it going this way on one side, then back that way. It would look kind of weird. So just make sure it flows all the same way, all, all the same way, all the but make sure it go the right that way. So while I was in the middle of doing the project, doing the things, I took the time to explain how to find the center of each one of these. So I'm actually going to let past me explain to present you how to do that so that present me can go get a cup of coffee so that I'll be more entertaining in the future and probably more annoying too. But that's what editing's for. So when I set this up, I made sure that this border that goes all the way around right here was the same width as this stamp. So it's a half inch and it, it should line up perfectly all the way down. Now, if you don't have this stamp or you, uh, you have a wider one, then, then you're gonna have to adjust a little bit, but uh, it should work perfectly for this particular stamp. Um, if you don't have this one, Find one that'll work as, as best you can, maybe a camouflage tool or something like that. But the trick that I'm gonna show you, because we wanna make sure this is straight all the way down. We don't want it wobbling as it goes down through there, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our wing dividers. This should be a half inch. Let's double check it and make sure it's a half inch. I've got 0.52. All right, so there you go, 0.52. Hopefully you can see that, 0.52. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut that in half. That would be 0.26. There we go, 0.26. Then I'm gonna take my wing dividers and I'm gonna set it to that width. So now that I've got the center of it, what I should be able to do is take my wing dividers and I'm gonna lay the outside arm in the little trough that we created and I'm gonna lightly Scribe a line down through there, and that will get my center line for me. So let's do that to all four sides. Now this is important. So this is at the top and bottom. This one right here is not where we're gonna put the border stamp. We're gonna put it in this middle bar. You got one, two, three. We wanna put it on the second bar. So we're gonna do this one, this one, this one. And then when we get to the bottom, we're gonna do the second one here as well. All right, so it should look something like this. Hopefully that line's gonna show up. You should be able to see a line right there. Yep, so that runs all the way down the center. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this tool right here and we're gonna line it up. So you've got the V right here and you've got the point 
right here. We want both of those to line up with that line that we just created. If you line it up correctly, it should fit perfectly. So quick little pro tip, as you're working with the larger stamps, if you roll it, it'll make sure that you get an even impression all the way around. It'll take more than one strike, but it'll make sure you get an even impression all the way around. Okay, and you wanna overlap the rear one, and that'll make sure that you're in line for the next one. So when you get to the end, you want to overlap as many as it takes to be able to land it perfectly. I may need to overlap two, I might need to overlap one, but if you do it correctly, it should land right at the edge. So how did past me do? Did I explain well enough? Because I don't think I can explain it any better than that. So now go through, we're going to stamp all four borders front and back. Make sure that your rope design runs the same direction all the way around. We don't want it going this way, one way, and that way, the next, it just looked terrible. So same way, all the way around. See on the other side. So now that we've got the border done all the way around, front and back, I hope you're getting excited because uh, it's starting to come into shape. I hope you see what we're doing here. Next is going to be the spine. We're going to do the four sections in the middle. And one of the things that you might run into is it'll be a little difficult in some of the little areas to get your stamp up in there and make sure that you've got texture. So again, I'm going to let past me explain how to do this because it's a lot more simple than what you might think, but it's really hard to explain verbally. I'd rather show you. So I'm going to let past me do it again. So now that we've got that done all the way around, now we're going to do the center. And we're not going to do the end pieces right here. So the, the bottom piece and the top little section right there, we're not going to do that. We're going to do the four sections between the bars. And we're going to use the same tool to do that. Use the same tool. If you don't have this one, use the same tool that you did this with. And the easiest way to do this, we're going to do the same thing that we did before. So take your tape measure or your digital calipers. I am... 34 millimeters. So I'm at 34 millimeters on that. I'm going to cut that in half and that would put me at 17. Here we go. 17. Take my wing dividers. <clears throat> Same thing. I'm going to open it up here. So with this one, I'm going to start in this one, not here, here. I'm going to drop this one down in that, that groove right there. And I'm gently going to score it. When I get to the band, I'm going to lift it. And we'll do it again. There we go. So that gives us our center line down the spine. We're going to do the same thing with this. So now what we want to do is we've got the braid down the center. We want to line these notches up with these. And that way we can make sure that it, it goes, that we're straight. Now, one thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to tip it to the center. Because if we don't, you can see right here, it's right up against the edge. So you don't have to tip it a lot, just enough to make sure that we're not biting into that outer border over here. Now, I'll show you a trick on this right here. So we've got this section right here that it's kind of the tail end of it and you can see it doesn't have an impression in there. What we want to do with that is we're going to put the point of the tool down in there. We're going to tip it so the tail is not touching. See if you can see that. So it's up on its nose. And so we're going to take that and we're going to give it a bump. Just like that. All right, it's starting to get there. It's really starting to come to life. The next step, we're going to jump back over to our traditional bevel just for a second. And what we want to do with this is we want to bevel on the outside. So we're going to bevel away from the border all the way around. That's going to give it a little bit more of the impression that it's raised up. So go ahead and do the four front and back and bevel all four sides of each section on the spine. Now, at this point, you might be asking, um, Daniel, why did you have me use the steep beveler if you're just going to have me use the traditional beveler? Well, this is how I go about 
getting that extra definition on the edges of all my tooling. So I'm kind of giving you one of my, my secrets here in that I bevel my projects multiple times. And some of my projects are, are beveled literally five or six times. It just depends on the situation. So now you've beveled everything but the design in the middle. That's what we're gonna work on next. Not all bevels are gonna create the same effect. You essentially have three different kinds. You have a traditional bevel, which is just off flat. That's gonna create a lot of shading, a lot of shadows. You have steep, which is gonna be a hybrid between traditional and extra steep. It's gonna give you a crisper line and some shadow. And then there's extra steep. So traditional, steep, and extra steep. Extra steep essentially creates a line, a very well-defined border. So for this, we want to compress or mat down the center of the design. So we're going to go with a steep bevel. Remember, traditional, steep, extra steep. And we're going to go with the steep bevel from Weaver. I'll put a link in the description so you know exactly which one I'm talking about. So if you're intimidated by doing this, the beveling portion of it, let's start with the bigger of the two designs. It's a little less intimidating. And the key here is to make sure that your bevel is on the inside and we're beveling towards the middle of the design. Remember, we're gonna compress this into the leather. We're not making it look raised. So real quick, before we get too much further into the video, if these are the kind of videos and projects you want us to cover here in this little segment, it's really important that you click the thumbs up button. That tells Weaver and YouTube that we're on the right track. Once you've got the anchor done, we're gonna jump over and do the design on the front. I know it might look a little bit more intimidating. It's really not. Just take your time, make sure your bevel fits into the area that you're trying to bevel. If it doesn't, or you're unsure about it, save it till the next step. I'm gonna show you how we're gonna use a matting tool to get into those tiny little areas if you can't get in there with a bevel. As you go through, be careful about beveling it on the wrong side. Remember, your bevel should be on the inside of the design, not the outside. If you do happen to bevel on the wrong side of the line, no big deal. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Just go back and rebevel it correctly. It won't look perfect, but it will look better than if you leave it incorrect. Now that we've got the front design and the back beveled, now we're gonna jump over to the next step, which I think is seven, the matting tool. If this is a technique you've never really done before, or maybe you've dabbled with it, there's a couple of tricks to making sure it works. Number one, the idea here is to get a consistent mat all the way across the area that we're working in. We don't want divots and tool marks. We want it nice and textured evenly across the area. So what you want to do is start in one of the corners and compress that corner down reasonably so that you have a nice, consistent, well-defined area. Then we're going to use the wider portion of your matting tool and we're slowly going to nibble away at the area that we want to work into. What this is doing is it's taking small bite-sized bites out of the area that we're trying to compress while the rest of the tool is ensuring that you're going over it multiple times, a lot like you did with your bevel. So the key here, the whole goal is consistency and even mat all the way across, not speed. Take your time. A quick little pro tip, if you're having a hard time getting up in those corners, flip your matting tool around and use the pointy end of it. That'll give you a really well-defined area up in those tight little corners. And if you do happen to start getting tool marks in there, just go back over it again, gently but firmly, work them out as best you can. All right, you made it. All the beveling, all the tooling's done. Now you can dye. It's not what I meant. Step number nine, dyeing the leather. I think it's nine. So the next step is we're gonna go in with some dark dye. I'm gonna be using dark brown. I would encourage you to use dark brown, blue, dark blue, or black. And we're gonna paint that into the area that we just matted down. Now the reason we're putting a dark color down is because we're gonna be using a metallic, as you can see, in that area here in a little while. And anytime you put a metallic down, you want a dark base. It really helps those metallics pop. So as you're going in, you wanna take the largest paintbrush that you're comfortable working with in that area and rough it in. We're not trying to get super crisp lines as we go up to the edge. You want them crisp, but they don't have to be perfect. 
and then come back with a smaller paintbrush and work into those tight little areas. That'll allow you to work through it as quickly as possible while still controlling the amount of paint of uh, dye that you're putting down. So one of the things you'll notice is as I bring that paintbrush over to the area that I'm going to work in, a lot of times I'll have my hand under the paintbrush. And that's because I'd rather it drip on me than on my project. I know I'll end up with dye on my hand for a day or two, um, but I'd much rather have it on me for a day or two than permanently on my project somewhere that I didn't want it to be. We're getting really, really close. I hope you're falling in love with this thing as much as I was at this point. The next step is going to be to dye the rest of the project. Now I say the rest of the project, the only area that we're not going to be dyeing is the rope border. So that would be all four sides, front and back, and the spine. We want to make sure that we keep any of the dye that we're putting on there off of those areas. So I'm going to be using mahogany for mine. I wanted that nice rich color. It's Phoebe's Mahogany. You can get it from Weaver. We'll put a link in the description. And we're going to be applying it with a paintbrush. Now as you do this, it'll look a little scary to start with because when you apply dye with a paintbrush, it just looks terrible for the first couple of layers. But as you apply more, it'll even out, especially if you're using Phoebe's Pro Dye because it only gets to a certain level and then it just quits and you can bring the rest of it up to match. So as you're putting the dye on the rest of the project, don't forget these little pocket flaps that go on the inside here. Those would have come with your kit from Weaver. Um, I may have possibly forgotten to do these when I did the rest of it and had to get all my dyes and paints back out. Otherwise it wouldn't have matched. So um, yeah, don't do that. Step number, I've totally lost track. Time to paint. So for me, I went with Angelus metallic bronze. I really like the idea of this, this bronzy color with the mahogany and then the natural rope. For you, it's totally going to depend on what color you went with. If you went with a black, then you're probably going to want to do silver. And we're going for a light coat of paint here. We're not trying to put so much on that we lose all the texture. I like using a flat wide brush to do the majority, then going back with a smaller brush to get into those tight little corners. Get as close as you can to the edges, but don't stress out too much. The antique's really gonna clean that up for us. So a quick little do like I say, not like I did moment, cause I totally didn't make this mistake, is be careful about getting your hand into the area that you just painted and then tracking it onto your dyed area. It can be removed, but it's a little bit of a pain. Um, and also on the side note, that's why I don't wear rubber gloves while I paint because I want to be able to feel the, the wetness on my hand if I happen to get paint on my hand. So be careful about tracking paint into the rest of your project. So now that we've got the design in the middle, front and back done, we're going to go back and we're going to work on the squares. And I want you to be real careful here about getting those crisp edges. The antique's not going to help straighten these edges out. So you got to be really careful about making sure you got nice, clean, crisp edges. So one quick little note is you might have to do multiple coats. Don't stress if it looks thin, just go back over it with another light coat and it'll even out. So we are really, really close now. We've got the, the center design front and back. We've got all four squares front and back done. The only thing left now is the framing and we're gonna make this real simple. We wanna do the outside bars first. One, two, three, four. Do that front and back. After you're done with that, we're gonna do the inner bars. So one, two, front and back. The next step is sealing the project. Now, anytime I seal a project, I have a rule if it's got paint on it, and that is no contact. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to take a sponge, put tan coat on it, and then start rubbing that tan coat into my project. There's a good chance that it's going to remove the paint. So the way I like to seal any project that has paint on it is I go with the aerosol version of Leather Sheen. Leather Sheen's great because it has a waxy base to it, so if it gets hit with some water, there's a pretty good chance that it's not going to ruin the paint job on it. So 12 to 14 inches off the project, a nice light coat, shouldn't look wet, give it a few seconds to dry, then do it again eight to ten coats you should be locked in nice and tight and the paint won't go anywhere and the last step before we assemble it time to antique now for my project because i've got mahogany and a bronze on here i'm going to go with a black antique but you can go with any color that you want to i would suggest a dark color antique 
And this is one of my favorite steps of the project is putting the antique on there. One, because, you know, I get to make a mess and let's face it, I'm a guy, that's my natural state. But the other reason is because it really adds a lot of depth to it. It makes the designs that we took so long putting in there it really makes them pop. So now what we're going to do is we're going to spread the antique onto the project, really generous with the antique. It doesn't have to be gobbed on there, but at the same time, you don't have to worry about putting too much on there either. You just want to make sure that you get it down in all the cracks. We're going to let it sit for about five minutes and then we're going to wipe the majority of it back off. A quick little pro tip is to use a chip brush to apply the antique. You can get them for like 50 cents at Home Depot. They rinse out pretty easily and when you're done with them, you just toss them. Once we've let it sit for about five minutes, we're going to take a paper towel and just buff it off the top. That will remove the majority of it off the surface, leaving a good bit of it down in the cracks. Last two steps. You didn't think you would make it, did you? So the last two steps before we assemble it, number one, we just finished wiping off the majority of it. So we're going to let it sit for about another 10 or 15 minutes. We're going to take our paper towel again and buff it really good. Not hard, not a lot of friction. We're just trying to take the, the antique off the surface. We're going to buff it really good. Then we're going to go back with some tan coat. and we're gonna rub that in gently. What that's gonna do is it's gonna seal it and lock it in, and it's gonna brighten those colors back up. The, the antique has a tendency to mute the colors. The tan coat will brighten it back up. So what's left? We've got it tooled, we've got it painted, we've got it dyed. Really, the only thing left is to assemble it. Before we get to that, I wanna mention to stick around till the end of the video, because I've got another pro tip for you that may really affect how well your journal cover fits your journal. But next I'm gonna give you an up close look of the final results of the Pirate Journal. But you might be saying, uh, we haven't even assembled the thing yet. Well, Chuck did a fantastic video on how to put it together, how to saddle stitch it, and there's no reason for me to recreate a video that he's already done a fantastic job at. Just make this one longer when I can just point you over to Chuck's video. So that's what we're gonna do for that. I'll put a link in the description below. Before you head over to Chuck's video on how to put it together, let's take a look at the final results of the Pirate journal and make sure you stick around for that final pro tip that ensures you're going to get the best fit possible for your journal cover. Glad you stuck around for the final pro tip. This one's really gonna make a big difference if you've got a super tight fit on your journal. These kits from Weaver are so precise that the thickness of the leather can affect how well it fits. And the way you can tell if it's too tight is your journal doesn't wanna close. It'll, it'll, it'll gap a little bit like that. So the easy way to fix this, take it back off your journal, dampen the inside of the spine just a little bit. It doesn't need much. You can always put more on there later. Then put it back on your journal and sit something heavy on it. What's gonna happen is by forcing it to close, that damp spine is gonna stretch a little bit and you'll get the best fit possible for your journal. That's it for me today. I'll see you in the next video. In the meantime, go make something amazing.